when I was a boy of about nine, I said to my dad, Pop, could we go see the Indians? But he said, son, we can't. They're all gone. It's true, the Miwoks, the gentle coastal Indians of Marin, have all departed, and all they left were a few artifacts, some drawings, and a small scattering of history gathered by the first settlers. A friendly people, the Miwoks lived in cone-shaped huts, fashioned of reeds they gathered along the shore, and made beautiful jewelry from bits of seashell. Tools and weapons were made from stone. No one knows just how long the Miwoks lived on our western shores. They left few records, and the last of them are gone. They succumbed mostly to the diseases brought by civilized man. along the coast, the Spanish settlers out of Mexico established a chain of ports and missions, of which San Rafael Arcanquel was one of the northernmost. With the cross and the sword, they extended the dominions of the Spanish king and brought the Roman Catholic faith to the Indians of Marin. Nestled around the missions and the small forts were the ranchos of the great Spanish settler families. In the first 75 years of Marin history, very few Americans were seen. But with the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in 1849, the easy Spanish way of life gave way to American hustle and bustle. By the turn of the century, Marin was a thinly populated rural area where kids rode horseback over dusty country roads, sometimes for miles, to modest schools, usually built of wood. If a boy's parents were reasonably well-to-do, he might have attended Mount Tamalpais Military Academy, located on 4th Street in San Rafael. Mount Tam had a fine academic standing and a broad program of sports. Like most military preparatory schools, it placed strong emphasis on physical fitness. In 1915, the war in Europe seemed far away and seniors shown here practicing physical drill under arms had little warning that in less than two years some would march away to war forever. When the German government declared unrestricted warfare, American ships and American lives at sea were endangered. And so President Wilson reluctantly signed the proclamation that sent the nation into World War I. Like thousands of other young Californians, Marin youths entered training camps and began to learn the deadly arts of combat. Some would not learn the lessons well enough. In case a German sub sank the ship on the way over, the boys took swimming lessons on dry land and then practiced what they had learned in the water. And on some gray and cheerless day, with banners flying, they marched away to make the world safe for democracy. With the young men gone to war, Marin women, like their sisters all over America,
took on all kinds of hazardous jobs. The war across the Atlantic was far away and movie cameras big and cumbersome. But just as close as San Francisco, Marinites could see a mock battle and afterwards get a chance to tour the trenches. November 11, 1918, the armistice was signed and Johnny came marching home all over America. Here in Marin, our own celebration was a combination parade, party, picnic, banquet, and barbecue held for thousands of Marinites in Muir Woods. The ladies wore their stylish hats and their prettiest dresses, and the men wore their Sunday suits. The smell of barbecue filled the woodsy air, and there was plenty to eat for all, room enough at the table for everyone. But the place of honor was reserved for the boys from Marin who had come home. No such party would be complete without a pie-eating contest, and the kids showed style and speed. Of course, the spectators enjoyed it, and later watched the older boys in games of sport, such as tug-of-war and foot races. Well, victory goes to the strong, they say, and the race to the swift. But what about the boys who didn't come home? By the 1920s, our world was changing, we had become a nation on wheels, and with our marvelous climate, Marin had many outdoor affairs. Social events, charity bazaars, all sorts of things. The ladies wore their finest dresses. Little girls twirled around upon their toes. And Dad probably stood behind the trees, smoking a cigar and wishing he hadn't come. Out at Olima, the Boy Scouts held a parade and then a snake dance to celebrate the funeral of the spirit of discontent. They buried that old ghost with full military honors. This handsome illustrated brochure showed one of Marin's great landmarks, the famous old Hotel Raphael. Built in Victorian times in what was called American Gothic style, it was a posh resort in 1919, this elegant ball and banquet celebrated a 50th wedding anniversary for a prominent Marin family. The Hotel Raphael was a popular resort for many years, but in 1928, a stubborn fire burned all of one day, all of that night, and most of the next day. And though it was fought bitterly, when it was finally out, all that were left standing were the trees and the brick chimneys. In 1931, the Depression was just around the corner, but this Marin family dressed in its finery and went to Easter services in their fine old ivy-covered church. On that beautiful Easter Sunday morning, spring was in the air, and the feeling of hope filled the hearts of all of us. When the services were over, most people liked to linger for a few minutes on the sidewalk, exchange the latest news, and talk to their neighbors. Then you climbed in the car and took the leisurely drive home. Some of the landmarks are still there. You hurried up the mountainside in the winding wooden steps to change out of your Sunday finery because very shortly the family would depart for McNear's Beach and an afternoon of picnicking, swimming, and good fun. The kids splashed, the young people swam, and the girls made faces or looked shy for the cameras.
Dad and the boys went for a boat ride, and Big Brother was so proud that he was allowed to run the engine. Mom and the ladies looked after the groceries, and Dad looked after his stomach. In the 1930s, if a lady wanted to shop in San Francisco, she caught the ferry boat, and that meant catching the trolley. Sometimes she had to hurry. If she got to the platform before the trolley arrived, there might be time to primp a bit. The big red cars made their way swiftly down through the central populous area of Marin, and with just a few steps across the ferry terminal, you made your way aboard the Berkeley or the Tamalpais or the Sausalito for a leisurely ride across the bay. San Francisco then, as now, was a good place to shop and maybe to work. If you were a commuter, the clock tower at the ferry building was your target twice a day. The ferry boat ride across the bay gave you time to read the papers or visit with friends. Perhaps at the railroad platform, you boarded the car for Manor Station, which was about halfway between Mill Valley and Larkspur. The ferries and trolleys were familiar to all of us, and most of us rode them at one time or another. But there was a vast construction project underway, which would change Marin and touch all our lives. In 1929, Working inside giant coffer dams in the tricky and treacherous currents of the Golden Gate, construction was begun on the piers that would support the bridge. And in 1934, the Bethlehem Steel Corporation began to stretch skyward with the tons and tons of steelwork. The tall towers were capped with two huge 62-ton single-piece castings that would make the saddles that supported the cables that suspended the bridge. From anchor to anchor on each shore, over the towers draped in graceful loops, a giant spinning machine, like a spider, began to hang the thousands upon thousands of fine, high-strength steel wires, which would be bundled into great cables. Carefully examined and smoothed by hand, the bundles were wrapped with more strong wire and covered with a rust-proof protection. Finally, the massive structure was complete and a month-long celebration with parades, floats, pretty girls, cheering crowds, politicians' speeches, and hoopla of all sorts marked the opening of the bridge. That momentous occasion changed all our lives with the completion of the link between San Francisco and marvelous Marin. On May 28, 1937, the bridge was opened to the public for the first time, and thousands of people came to walk across it. Families with toddlers, couples arm in arm, lone strollers, people who wanted to stop and stand on the bridge to watch the ships go under. And the first of the millions upon millions of automobiles began to stream across. Some experts said that bridge would carry all the traffic Marin would have forever. Well. In just 35 years, traffic had become so heavy that the Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transport District began to run ferry boats again on the bay. In 1939, the ominous clouds of war broke once again over Europe, and the world found itself embroiled in another gigantic war. The United States tried to stay out of it, but high school boys in Marin, like people everywhere, began to toughen up for national defense. Two years later, the horror of war overtook the United States, and training camps, and troop ships, and foot soldiers slogging in the mud, and all the agony of battle came home to us. And here in Marin, civilians began to train to help protect themselves if our shores were invaded. 
police and fire departments set up emergency communication networks. A central civil defense headquarters was established. Ladies auxiliaries served the weary workers. Even the private pleasure craft on the bay were drafted for coast watch duty. The Marin Red Cross held classes in first aid, bandaging, and artificial respiration. And the Boy Scouts learned how to set up and operate field kitchens, manning hoses, handling firearms, riding fire trucks. In shacks on mountaintops as sky watchers, people everywhere learned to serve, to protect our homeland while our boys were away fighting. With lightweight cameras, the newsreel services brought the war to screens of theaters all over Marin, and people at home could see the boys in action and the agony and hell of war. In the Marin ship pipe shop were fabricated the 20 miles of complex piping which went into every Marin ship tanker. Largest of all ship sections is this 115 ton engine room foundation for the heart of the ship. Only at Marin ship was the great 10,000 horsepower propulsion motor lifted in one piece onto the hull. Taken from the 26 tired truck on which it was assembled, the motor is swung into the air by two cranes. An iron-nerved rigger climbs onto the 20-ton lifting rig to transfer the load from one crane to another. And then down to earth he rides on the hook he is freed. Carried to the stern of the ship, the motor is carefully lowered onto its foundation and then aligned so that its shaft will meet the propeller with mathematical precision. Meanwhile, suspended from a special tower, the tail shaft of the ship is prepared for coupling to the motor at one end and for fitting into the 17-ton propeller at the other. In this pre-fitting operation, machinists must test and retest for perfect alignment, while the shiny brass glistens in the marine sunshine. As tall as a three-story building is the big midship deckhouse, already largely outfitted on the skid. There, in front of the selected way, the great weight must be transferred in midair. Through use of a double coupling device, the load is shifted from the two transverse cranes to those that travel along each side of the way. Now the hook swings free. Lifted even higher, the section moves along far above the ship in staging until it reaches the proper point amidship. There it will be lowered gently onto the waiting hull. The great weight of these sections requires the use of 12 parts of rope to support each hook and headlock. This job completed, the never idle cranes have already gone back for the upper section, and now it too takes the same skyborne route. Like the recurring theme in a symphony were the launching, reenacted nearly once a week. Always similar, yet always different. Famous singers such as Todd Duncan, creator of the role of Porgy, drew enthusiastic applause. And then the gracious sponsor bespeaks the excitement and joy in everyone's heart. Now all is ready. In another moment, the ship will leap free and start down the way. And then smash, and the cool foam floats down the bow as the great ship moves toward the water. Here is something seldom if ever seen elsewhere, an unobstructed view of a great ship racing down the ways into the water. of patriotic morale was the purchase of $18 million in war bonds by employees, more than enough to pay for the entire shipyard.
Support and sacrifice on every level helped the war effort. The adults dealt with gasoline tokens, and tire rationing, and clothing and food coupons. The high school kids did something different. They organized rallies and marches and held scrap drives. Junk metal from all over our county was picked up and pushed along the supply line to go to the vast furnaces and be turned into machines to help us win. With a slashing, island-hopping war in the Pacific and a foot-slogging, often muddy war in Europe, Marin boys fought and died for four long years until, in 1945, final victory came. Secure in our might, America turned in the late 1940s to peace and the good times. And Kay Adams turned her camera on a high school graduation in the amphitheater at Mount Tamalpais High School. They don't hold the graduations there anymore. It's too big a school for too small an amphitheater. But when this was shot in 1949, it was a wonderful ceremony. Handsome young people, flags flying, bands playing, and of course, proud parents. The pomp and pageantry were colorful. The crowd had a good time. And all the parents were pleased as punch. Afterwards, we posed for photos. And this Mount Tam graduate was radiantly lovely in her white gown and scholar's mortarboard. Each summer in the 50s, Kay turned her camera on the annual Aquacade. Boys did comedy stunts. The girls did water ballets with precision swimming. outdoor beauty of Marin, with just a touch of Hawaii, seemed to make these young people sparkle with glowing health and good humor. Younger children, too, had their day in the spotlight. With tinseled crowns and royal robes, they acted out the old legends and fairy tales we all remember so well. Prima ballerinas and court jesters and courtly dancers bowing gracefully to one another filled the stage for them. If these youngsters, acting out their pageantry and plays in backyards, seemed touched by magic, so too did their older brothers and sisters who trooped to the mountaintops to play their commedia and buffoonery in the mountain meadow plays. For 50 years, Dan Tothero, writer and stagecrafter, helped put on the plays. He's gone, but we all fondly remember him. Like the rest of the nation, the pace of growth of Marin increased with a rush in the 1950s, and soon our county government found the ancient and honorable courthouse bulging at its seams. Constructed in the 1870s as a small but handsome neoclassic building, the growth of Marin County added wings on each side of the courthouse, but even this was not enough. The burgeoning population and the increasing rush of county business eventually made it too small. And so a new site was selected, and the famous and controversial Frank Lloyd Wright, working in what he called organic architecture, presented Marin County with this new and revolutionary civic center. The first section of the civic center, the administration building, was completed in 1962. And when at last the Hall of Justice was added to it, 
the last of the county services were moved out of the old courthouse. Silent and forlorn it stood, with only occasional echo of steps, until May 26, 1971. On two successive nights, in the wee small hours, arsonists set fire to the old building. The first attempt failed, but in the second, it burned to the ground. In the morning, only ashes and tumbled bricks remained. The last major work of Frank Lloyd Wright was the Marin Civic Center. Taking its inspiration from the rolling hills of Marin, it fitted into them in what he called organic architecture. A handsome complex of buildings, it was designed to include an auditorium, a convention center, and a sports pavilion as well as housing the county government. The Board of Supervisors have a handsome fan-shaped room for their public hearings with comfortable seating and excellent acoustics for the public so that all the discussions and arguments can be clearly heard. Under the central dome stands the Marin County Main Library with its immense storehouse of literature and learning. For a reporter's tape recorder, Mr. Wright talked about how he arranged the workspace in the building. They're treated like human beings, and everybody having an office or a place in that building is in a commanding position to see the great beauty that surrounds it and feel that the being a tenant in that building according to that beauty, is a new dignity in his life. What about those arches, someone asked? I hope you notice that those are not arches. They're suspended crescents all the way along, hanging from the floor above, making these lovely arched forms, but plastic instead of structural. I believe in every respect that we have saved the beauty of the site, cooperating with it, and coming out at the end with a complete synthesis of ground and building, which is really what organic architecture should mean. It's a complete envelope of imperishable steel and concrete. Such a building as that would last at least 3,000 years and it is indestructible, and it is earthquake proof, and it is all those proofs. What you're witnessing is a great simplicity. Simplicity is ordinarily very expensive, you know. But in this case, I think simplicity is really economic. It's 200 years since the Spanish came to Marin and found the gentle Miwok Indians. Since then, people have come and gone and the times have changed radically, but always it's been interesting and exciting. Some of the story I've left out, some I passed over, some you know already. What will our future be like? Will we follow in the footsteps of our pioneering forefathers? How will we spend our next 200 years? <laughs>